Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, indeed it is an honor and privilege to be in this chamber where we have freedom of speech, where we can speak out uh, on numerous issues and know that there is no repercussions for what we want to say, where we have a true opportunity to air our grievances. And it is fitting that tonight we are having a debate about the situation in Ukraine, and to all our Ukrainian friends who are watching us tonight, I say Dobry Vechna. And while we're here discussing the current crisis in Kiev, Lviv, and other communities across Ukraine, we know that uh, Canadians are watching. My email today has been inundated with Canadian Ukrainians, with civil society organizations, uh, feeding me their statements, their concerns, their uh, press releases, and background briefing notes on the situation in, in Ukraine. Media in Canada are watching this story closely. And at the same time, many of my friends in Ukraine have also been contacting me, making sure that I see the live feeds coming in from Independence Square in Kiev on what's happening to the Maidan. And, uh, wanting to make sure that Canada is fully aware of the strong hand of government, of the police brutality that is taking place at this moment in Ukraine. And I know that the Ukrainian government is watching, that they are here to follow this debate, to see what Canadian politicians are saying, are monitoring what is happening in our media, what is happening through organizations like Canadian Friends of Ukraine, the League of Ukrainian Canadians, and of course, the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. And we just read in the record a letter that was sent from our friend, Paul Grott. Now, as someone who is proud of my Ukrainian heritage, uh, I have been active in carrying uh, many different issues forward on behalf of Ukrainian Canadians uh, here in, in the House of Commons which includes my private member's bill in the Hall of Damore, which includes numerous selection monitoring trips to Ukraine, which included being in Ukraine once Prime Minister, when he was the first Prime Minister to ever say, and first world leader to ever say in Ukraine, that the Hall of Damore was a genocide. Something that I was incredibly proud to see happen, and something that, when he said it, that the current leadership could not even say it within Ukraine itself. And, you know, we witnessed, when I first got elected 10 years ago, we witnessed the Orange Revolution in Ukraine. And there was so much hope brought with that. They overturned a debunked election, which now the person that they had thrown out is now the president in, 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 in Viktor Yanukovych. Their hopes rode on Viktor Yushchenko, made him president, thought he would bring about change. It never materialized, unfortunately. And then we have seen the selective justice process where former political leaders are imprisoned. People are frustrated with that. Not that they're saying that, that everything that Yulia Temchenko did was right, but they're saying she never got a fair trial. It just raises that question of whether or not there is true judicial independence within Ukraine. You know, one of the reasons that so many of us in this house, in this chamber, have been to Ukraine on multiple occasions to watch elections, to observe how they're carried out, to communicate with people in the electoral system about reform. And what we continue to see is gerrymandering to the benefit of the current party in power. You know, all of us are concerned about the quashing of civil liberties, freedom of speech, freedom of press, judicial independence, respect for the rule of law. You know, we have had numerous complaints coming from the academics that their courses, their teaching, are continually monitored and interfered with by the Department of Education in Ukraine. We have to move the yardsticks. And that's not happening. You know, we, 
have been reaching out to Ukraine. Ukraine has tried to become more integrated into the world economy. They joined the World Trade Organization. And what was one of the first things they did? And although it's legal, one of the first things they did was applied tariffs to over 370 commodities and products and services across this country. You know, we're trying to negotiate a free trade agreement with Ukraine, and that's not negotiating in good faith, in my opinion. And we know, Mr. Chair, that that didn't sit well in the craw of the European Union, who is in the process of closing a deal with Ukraine. It was to be signed off at the end of January, or end of November in Vilnius, <coughs> in Lithuania, and to have a true economic cooperative agreement, free trade, more integration within the European Union for the Ukrainian people. And of course, with President Yanukovych walking away from that deal has created this huge public outcry. So what we witnessed <coughs> over the last 10 years in election interference and no respect for the rule of law to continued Soviet-styled governance systems, and it has now accumulated in what we see happening with the Euro Maidan. We have to continue to engage Ukraine. We can't allow this to continue to happen. And at the same time, Mr. Chair, we have to see some good faith from Ukraine. And we haven't seen any good faith in a long, long time. But the closest thing that we've seen is when they actually went and released Yuri Lutsenko, who was one of the political leaders and, and uh, lawyer for Yulia Temenchenko. That's the only step of good faith that we've seen coming from this administration. You know, when I did the, my last election monitoring in, in Ukraine for the uh, parliamentary elections uh, last year, I was part of the uh, Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, the OSCE parliamentary delegation. And there was a number of us that were part of that parliamentary delegation. And we were there on the ground doing the election monitoring. Definitely seen improvements in the way the elections have been carried out. But starting this weekend, is a number of by-elections in Ukraine because so many results were thrown out for interference, for fraud, and other uh, co corruption charges on, on a number of, of different uh, oblasts. And so they're redoing those elections. And there's going to be, again, another Canadian delegation going over, run by Can, uh, Can Dem. And they will be, again, monitoring the situation, but it's going to be under a much more difficult scenario because of the peaceful protests that are taking place by people. But unfortunately, those protesters are being shoved aside, their Kent City ripped down, uh, their Maidan being destroyed. But just last week, the OSCE had a meeting of the, their 20th ministerial council were, was held in Kiev, and our Minister of Foreign Affairs, who has had such a strong principled stand on how we engage with Ukraine, had, um, was there. And, I, and I, I was just so proud when I saw him and Paul Grodd, who is the president of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, walking through Independence Square with the Canadian Maple Leafs strapped on their back, showing the people of Ukraine that Canada stands in solidarity with them that we will stay engaged. We will make sure that their aspirations will be realized. And I just want to uh, make sure we, we look at what the purpose of the OSCE is. And this is an organization that we want to see Ukraine use as their basis of moving forward from a security standpoint, from an economic cooperation standpoint, from a democracy standpoint. And the OSCE Secretary General uh, Lambinto Zanier uh, said, at the eve of the Ministerial Council in Kiev last week. And he said, peaceful dialogue is at the core of the OSCE's work and finding common ground through political means is its reason d'etre. Respect of fundamental rights, such as freedom of assembly, the right to free expression, and giving journalists the liberty to do their work is essential to ensuring cohesive and secure societies. That's all we want, Mr. Chair, is that the current administration in Ukraine 
allow the society in Ukraine to mature, to be free, to be democratic, and respect the rule of law. Questions and comments? Castillo, come on tide. The Honorable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'd like to thank the Honorable Member. He obviously has a deep commitment to uh, Ukraine and to the Ukrainian uh, Canadian community in Manitoba. Um, many tonight have spoken, Mr. Chair, about uh, the briefing note provided by the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. And of course, there's high regard for that organization in this country and advising all sides of the House on appropriate actions. Uh, recommendation 6 says this, in concert with United States and European authorities, play a leadership role in the G8, the G20, and the International Monetary Fund, and un other international fora to explore all the ways in which the international community can combat money laundering in and through Ukraine, explore with its international partners the means by which the international travel and illicit business activities of corrupt business people government officials and their families could be restricted in accordance with applicable Canadian law. Now, when we uh, had our delegation, foreign affairs delegation to Ukraine, we actually had a, 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 a table meet with us who are business people who operate uh, the Chamber of Commerce for Ukraine and Europe and so forth, uh, Canadian businessmen in Ukraine. And they identified deep concern that uh, one has to have deep pockets to invest in Ukraine. We're calling for support and continued investment and perhaps human rights through trade, but there are deep problems. So I'm wondering if the Honourable Member could speak to that recommendation uh, by the uh, UCC and whether we ought to be taking a more strategic approach to our trade relations with Ukraine to try to direct more action on freedom and democracy. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I want to thank my friend for her question. And I'll just say that, that um, you know, the Government of Canada has taken every opportunity to register its deep and ongoing concerns regarding this uh, uh, the, the, the devaluation of democracy within Ukraine. And just in November, just last month, we expressed our deep disappointment over Ukraine's decision to suspend its negotiations. And, there, you know, we all expected to sign the, the UK or the European Union um, agreement for increased democracy and cooperation and economic uh, prosperity. So that was a missed opportunity. And that's why we see the protests on the street. And I, I, I appreciate all the uh, comments and, and ideas that have come forward from uh, Ukrainian Canadian Congress. And, you know, the number, there's number two issue here uh, that they laid out, as one that I think that all of us can, can really rally behind. This is a call upon Ukraine's president to respect the freedom of its citizens, to peacefully assemble, to call upon Ukraine authorities to respect this right and apply restraint in their interaction with these peaceful protesters. We're not seeing that. As we're sitting here right now, their uh, Maidan is being taken down, being destroyed, uh, and that isn't being done in a peaceful manner. So we need to continue to look at all avenues, G8, G20 for sure, European uh, Union has been the strongest leader on, on this front. Uh, I appreciate all the work that they have done in their ongoing negotiations and what was their hopes of a successful conclusion to the current round of discussions on their, Ukraine's greater cooperation and economic uh, trade with the European Union. Questions and comments, the Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. As I uh, indicated uh, earlier, is that as we speak on this very important uh, issue, uh, we know Independence uh, Square is uh, uh, being covered by literally thousands of, uh, of police officers, and there's a whole real concern in regards to how protesters are actually being uh, treated. I listen uh, and I appreciate all the comments that are being uh, made. We all care deeply about uh, Ukraine. Uh, we share in the concerns that many of our constituents and Canadians as a whole, uh, especially those of Ukrainian heritage uh, who might uh, are listening in on the bait or wanting to, to see answers. Uh, I especially appreciate the comments uh, from uh, the member uh, opposite because I, I know that he has been deeply engaged and I appreciate when he talks about the Holodomor, uh, he speaks the truth on it and, and very much appreciate it. The, the question that I have is that as we 
are here right now and we know what's taking place now live because of news coverage, um, are there some specific things that he believes that we could be doing that could have an impact? For example, the member from Wascana made reference to uh, having some form of, of sanctions for those politicians, including the president, uh, so that they don't have you know, free travel in, uh, throughout the world. Are there things that he believes that we could be doing now that could be uh, uh, providing hope for those that might be listening or uh, might be able to have more of an impact uh, on what's happening today? Uh, in, in Ukraine, in particular Independence Square and the many other protest sites. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I want to thank my friend from uh, Winnipeg North for his comments. And yeah, you know, and there, there, there could be two schools of thought on this. You know, there's definitely those that want to see us bring forward sanctions, want to see us um, be tougher in our dealings, to walk away from any cooperation that we have with Ukraine. You know, uh, we have the Youth Mobility Agreement. We've uh, had discussions which we have suspended uh, already on, on uh, Canada-Ukrainian free trade. Uh, we have military cooperation in, in training officers and, and doing officer exchanges between Ukraine and Canada. Uh, some people will say, well, we should be stopping that. And definitely we should be looking at the oligarchs and, and other uh, powerful people within Ukraine who have money stashed away around the world and, and applying some freezers on that. And I'm not opposed to some of those ideas, but I think from a government standpoint, definitely what I'm hearing from the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, what I'm hearing from my constituents who are interested in this, uh, whether they have Ukrainian heritage or not, Mr. Chair, is, is, is they want to see us more engaged. They want to see us uh, pulling the people of Ukraine and, and, and the governance that they have there into more of a Western model. If we abandon them now or push them away, and anything that's seen as pushing them away may embolden some of their neighbors. And right now, you know, one of the reasons we're, where we are today is because of some of the bullying tactics that have been uh, implemented uh, from some of their neighbors to the north. And because of that interference and the fear-mongering that has taken place to uh, essentially push uh, President Yanukovych from walking away from the table with the European Union, uh, we need to be out there with the Europeans, with the Americans, with other allies who want to see a stronger, more westernized, more democratic uh, Ukraine. And uh, we, we're going to have to be fairly sensitive on how we move forward because we don't want to allow any uh, dollars to, to flow into the wrong hands. But we definitely won't believe that economic prosperity is tied to increased trade uh, with the European Union and the rest of the world uh, and not to be caught up in old relationships, uh, imperialistic relationships, that have not benefited the people of Ukraine for the last century. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. We've only got two minutes, so one minute for question, one minute for answer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you know, I guess some observers have, uh, have indicated that the European Union could have done more. Uh, you know, Ukraine was in a difficult financial situation, had to come up with $10 billion to uh, avoid defaulting. And uh, so the European Union did offer certain things. For example, it, it offered to sell um, Russian gas to Ukraine at prices lower uh, than uh, Ukraine actually pays for the gas it currently gets from Russia. And uh, Ukraine walked away from this, deal, from this arrangement. It uh, didn't want to uh, jeopardize its relationship with Russia. So there's something going on here that's above and beyond just money. Um, and maybe uh, my, uh, my colleague could comment on, on the mindset of, of, the, of the Ukrainian administration Victor Yanukovych in particular, what, what do you think is going on here and what can Canada do to try and change some of that behaviour? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, you have a little over a minute. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to thank uh, my friend, Parliamentary Secretary for Public Works for his, his question. And I, I can say that, uh, you know, it, you never know exactly what is in the mind of President Yanukovych these days. There's a lot of speculation out there. Uh, but, you know, I believe that what we're living with here is, is still the remnants of Soviet mentality, uh, that technocrat uh, approach to the way they govern their people. And uh, I have a great concern that uh, the current uh, administration uh, would rather be more uh, tied into the past than look to the future. And uh, I guess we just have to continue to reach out to the people of Ukraine and hopefully see uh, this peaceful protest the Euro uh, Maiden protests that we're seeing in Independence Square in Kiev and in communities across Ukraine accumulate in the change of heart of President Yanukovych. 
I ask that uh, he strongly consider, and I ask my friends from the uh, Ukrainian embassy to carry that message back, that they strongly consider the will of the people, that the wishes that they are um, really laying out, on their, they're wearing their hearts on their sleeves on the streets of Kiev right now, tonight, uh, and to listen to their cries and allow their will be really come into a final successful conclusion of moving Ukraine into a stronger European relationship, moving forward into the future, increasing prosperity. I always say, a rising tide lifts all ships. And the great prosperity that we see in Europe today, uh, which Canada is going to tie into with our own uh, comprehensive tra uh, free trade deal, that economic prosperity will be to the benefit of our friends in Ukraine if they go more into integration, both from an economic standpoint and also through cooperation on so many other avenues such as democracy, human rights and the rule of law.